So, uh, in this video, we're going to be looking at superconductivity. Uh, we're going to go through some of the experimental results for the early research in superconductivity uh, and a little bit of the theory as well. Um, this photo here is Brian Josephson at the Cambridge Laboratory in the early 70s, uh, just having uh, won the Nobel Prize um, for his work on Josephson junctions and superconductors. And there's Volker Heiner, who we've met before um, in uh, the lecture on order parameters. Okay, so um, some references first. There were lots of monographs, textbooks on this subject. Um, they range from quite advanced ones to elementary ones. Um, this one by Tilly and Tilly, which I mentioned before, is, is, um, is fairly basic. It's at a reasonably undergraduate, sort of graduate student level, as is this one. It's an older book. The other ones tend to be uh, more advanced, although Cattell's Induction of Solid State Physics also has um, some uh, rather um, elementary discussion of, uh, of um, superconductivity. Okay, so um, now first I need to apologise and explain why I should be an expert in, it, in this area, but I'm definitely not. Um, uh, it doesn't hurt not being an expert because this is only an elementary lecture, but still, it would be nice to know a lot more. Um, so throughout my career I've been um, associated with places and people who were absolute founders of this area. So I did my early degree at um, my first degree at Sydney University in the, in the, um, in the theory department there, that's where I did honours. And they had their Blatt, Shafroff and Butler who developed an early theory of superconductivity which was shown later to be equivalent to the BCS theory of superconductivity. Um, then I did my PhD in Cambridge at the, at the Cambridge Laboratory in the Theory of Condensed Matter group. And in the Theory of Condensed Matter group there was Brian Josephson who's still there. Um, and he won the Nobel Prize in 73 for his work on uh, superconducting Josephson junctions. And his supervisor... Uh, who suggested the problem, I suspect, uh, Brian Pippard was also there. Uh, and um, Pippard used to come to lunch and ask us all kinds of very nasty elementary undergraduate questions, which were very difficult. Um, then I did a postdoc at uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and there at the time was Bob Schrieffer, who had also won a Nobel Prize earlier for, supercon for the BCS theory of superconductivity. Uh, I never talked to him, but I could have. Um, and... Uh, then I did my second postdoc at uh, the Collège de France uh, in Paris, working with Pierre Gilles de Gênes, who just won the Nobel Prize, not for superconductivity, but for other things. But um, de Gênes wrote the book and wrote down many of the equations for the gap uh, in superconducting uh, materials. Um, and his book was uh, translated uh, into uh, English by uh, Phil Pincus, who was um, a, uh, my first postdoctoral supervisor. So, and Pink Pincus was an expert on superconductors and other solid state kinds of things. So, I should know an awful lot about this area, and I don't. And the reason is that by the time I got to any of these places and worked with any of these people, uh, they'd all moved on. The physicists tend to move on. They'll, you know, good people will do one thing, then they'll move on to a completely different area. And that's what had happened. Um, and so, I didn't feel like um, asking them um, about the history of superconductivity. It was, it was a... A subject which is historical fact, and that's that's uh, that's why it's in this course. Okay, and there's 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 De Gen down the bottom, uh, smoking one of his cigars. All right, so some background. All right, the first thing we need to explain is why isn't everything a superconductor? Okay, because you have, if you have a free electron moving uh, in a um, uh, in free space uh, at constant speed, if it's not accelerating, it can't give up energy. And it, by itself, it is a superconductor. Okay, so free electrons should be superconductors. And the electron, electron wave moving through a perfect periodic lattice, uh, like you have in a solid state system, if the lattice is periodic, um, there's no scattering uh, and no loss. So it is a perfectly periodic lattice, and there's basically no scattering from that system, and there can be no loss in a perfect crystal. However, so that's, that's what you expect. Everything's basically a superconductor. However, of course... Crystals are not perfect. Here's a perfect crystal, but a, a, a real crystal has um, vacancies, it has interstitial impurities, it has substitutional impurities, it has um, displaced atoms as well here. Um, and um, on top of that, 
Uh, that's at t equals zero, they always have defects. But on top of that, even if you go to um, uh, t not equals zero, you just raise the temperature, even if you have none of these defects, you've always got lattice vibrations, okay? Thermal motion lattice vibrations, and the crystals are not perfect. And that imperfection gives rise to um, resistivity. So that's why systems are not all conductors, all perfect conductors, so all superconductors. So what do we expect from a metal? If we had a perfectly pure metal, which was um, you know, not, uh, not in any way doped or had defects in it, uh, what we would expect is electrical resistivity, which goes to zero as the temperature approaches zero, uh, and then climbs. So the resistivity should climb a bit, okay, due to thermal motion. Uh, if we have an impure metal, it will not go down to zero, uh, but it will still climb. Okay, so that's what we expect from a pure metal. We will get down to something, or pure metal, impure metal, we will get down to some, some um, zero in the case of a pure metal, an impure metal, it'll just go to some limit. That's what we expect for the resistivity. So the discovery we've already talked about in a previous lecture. Um, Kamling owners in Leiden did this uh, April 8, 9 and 11. Um, here's his graph of the resistance of mercury um, versus uh, temperature, okay, 4.2 degrees Kelvin, uh, and he gets a sudden drop um, to about uh, something he thinks is about 10 to minus 5 ohms, um, and so he's seeing there the superconducting transition, and as he says in his notes here, uh, this note basically says um, quick which is quicksilver, which is mercury, uh, naganog null, that's probably my terrible pronunciation of Dutch, but it means near enough null. He's seeing it basically as having zero resistance. Um, by the way, um, the superconducting transition is second order, not first order. This makes it look like it's first order, but that's because resistance is not the order parameter. Okay, so superconducting transition is in fact second order. This is not a good order parameter resistance, so you can't, um, you can't use that as your order parameter, but um, that's what uh, was found in 1911. Okay. And after that, not only mercury was found to be um, superconducting, but all these elements uh, in blue here uh, were all found to be superconducting. So there's mercury, but you know, basically pretty much anything you pick randomly is going to become superconducting at, um, at low temperatures. Uh, and some of these ones in green like iron, will only become superconducting if you put them, at, not at low temperatures, but also at at, at, um, at high pressures as well. So some of them become superconducting eventually. So you, you can see the number of elements that aren't superconducting is, well, it's maybe it's maybe a third or something that aren't superconducting. All right, so at least as far as we know. And here's a graph of the critical con superconducting temperature. So, of course, uh, in the very first experiment, we have to get down to about 4.2 degrees Kelvin, I think. Um, but uh, you have to make these things very cold to get superconductors. Um, and here we've got, uh, here's the time in years versus the critical temperature. So there's a critical temperature below which are superconducting, uh, and mercury is down here, the very first one. Um, that's quite low, but of course, um, as time goes on, you see uh, lots of other, other elements and alloys where you can get the temperature, critical temperature going up, 40 degrees Kelvin is quite high. And then in the 80s, uh, we had these uh, high temperature superconductors. These are high temperature ones. They're going up to, you know, up until, you know, 150 degrees Kelvin, which is not all that cold at all. Um, in fact, uh, you can get superconductivity now uh, above liquid nitrogen temperature. There's liquid nitrogen temperature, and you can go above that and still have superconductors. And there's a whole family of these different kinds of conductors. Okay, so that's the critical temperature you get for superconductors. Unfortunately, we don't have anything like room temperature superconductivity, which would be quite useful if we had such a thing and it doesn't exist. Um, and uh, until rooms are cooled down to liquid nitrogen temperatures, we're not likely to either. Okay, um, so let's get a quote from Charles Cattell, uh, who was in fact the PhD supervisor of Phil Pincus and the uh, postdoctoral supervisor of De Gen. Okay, so, um, he said in his, in, his, uh, in his book on solid state physics, in the superconducting state, the DC electrical re resistivity is zero or so close to zero that persistent electrical currents have been observed to flow without attenuation in superconducting rings for more than a year until at last the experimentalist wearied, experimentalist wearied of the experiment. Okay, so you, you can put a, you can generate a, a, you take a ring like this, a superconducting ring, 
and you can generate uh, a current in it by changing the flux through it um, and uh, then let it persist and it just persists forever. Okay, you, it doesn't, you don't get any um, uh, diminution in the, in the current. Okay, so um, after the experiment showing um, superconductivity exists, there was, of course, uh, an attempt to explain it, but it took a long time to explain what was going on. Um, and, uh, of course, on his experiment is, when is it, 19, 1911? 1911, okay, so we're not getting an explanation of this for a very long time. Uh, and one hint, a very, very important hint, is the so-called isotope effects. Okay, isotope effect, where uh, if you take uh, different isotopes and replace them in, say, mercury, if, you know, mercury comes in different isotopes, and you measure the superconducting temperature, the critical temperature, you find the critical temperature scales as the mass of the mercury isotope to the minus a half. And here's this is probably the best graph. This is transition temperature versus average mass number, and you see, you know, Average mass number going down, transition temperature going up. Okay, and here's this graph here is for um, uh, for two different kinds of isotopes. Okay, so you can see that basically the isotope of mercury has a big effect on the transition temperature, and that tells us something very important because basically you have a different isotope of mercury. It's got the same number of electrons. It basically looks the same. Okay, uh, as far as the electrons go, uh, in principle, but the lattice which the electrons are moving in, the atomic nuclei are of different mass, and that tells you that the lattice is playing some role in this uh, in this kind of phenomenon. And that's a very big clue for the theorists. There's a lattice effect here. Okay, so that's the lattice effect. Um, other things that were well known. Um, the Meissner effect. So Meissner uh, and Oschenfeld in 1933 um, found the following effect. Um, if you put a... Uh, a magnetic field onto a superconductor at, say, a given uh, given temperature, above the superconducting temperature, where it's not a superconductor anymore, the uh, magnetic field just penetrates straight through. Okay? If you go down below the superconducting temperature, you find that the magnetic field is basically completely expelled from your system, uh, and that means a superconductor is a superdiamagnet. Okay? The magnetic field is expelled. Um, in fact... If you look at it more closely, you find that um, there is some very small penetration of the magnetic field into the sample. Um, and this was shown by the London brothers, Heinz and Fritz, um, who provided theory for this in 1935. The London brothers sound like they're British, uh, but in fact they're both German. Uh, and they were both Jewish and were forced to flee from Germany during the... The Nazi regime, uh, both of them actually fled to England uh, in, uh, at once, uh, and um, the first instance, in, uh, but they were both at Oxford for a while. Um, they showed that grad squared B is equal to B on lambda L squared. This is their, one of their equations, where lambda L is the penetration depth, and it's of order 10 to the minus 7 metres. If you have this in a plane geometry, you get down to this exponential decay. So they, they showed that um, in a magnetic field, there is some slight penetration of the field into the superconducting sample according to this, uh, this relation here, where lambda L. Lambda L is the London penetration depth. So that's the Meissner effect and the London penetration depth. Other experimental things you will find uh, that are important for um, superconductivity is that there is a critical uh, a magnetic field which you can apply which will destroy the superconducting state. Okay, so here's a graph of this. Here's the magnetic field you need to have the superconducting state destroyed. Here's the temperature at which um, you get the superconducting state. So, um, for instance, uh, here, magnetic field is zero. This is for uh, mercury. So at 4.2, magnetic field you need to apply, apply zero because the thing's not superconducting. As soon as you make it superconducting, um, the field you need to apply goes up and up and up and up until you get to... Um, uh, zero degrees Kelvin, the field there is about 0.04 Tesla. So here, if you're with this field and this temperature here, you're in a normal state here you're in the superconducting state. Okay, and that's true for other um, other samples as well, not just mercury, tin, indium, thallium, whatever you like. Uh, and this is the equation for the for what you expect for the um, 
the critical field to destroy superconductivity. Okay, so you can destroy it not just by heating it up, but also by putting applying a magnetic field to it. Right, so let's get on to the theory of this. Now, this theory took a long time to develop, um, mainly because you need to, to have combine quantum mechanics, which stat fears, uh, it's a many body theory as well. It's non trivial. Um, but a very early um, uh, part of this. Uh, a very early hint, in fact, a crucial hint here, uh, was given by a man called Herbert Fro Herbert, Herbert Froelich uh, in Liverpool in 1950, uh, and um, he proposed that there is an interaction between electrons mediated by phonons, in fact, mediated by the lattice. Okay, so what happens is you get electron coming in here, electron coming in here, they will exchange a phonon via the lattice. So here's the lattice. The lattice is important here. This is this is this is what. Frolic is using the, the fact that the lattice is known to be experimentally important. Um, and so electrons can scatter off, scatter off these phonons and, and, um, and you get an interaction between the two electrons. So there's an electron, electron interaction, electron electron interaction between um, the electrons caused by phonons, caused by the lattice. Um, and most importantly, it's attractive. That's the crucial point. So you think about electrons. Uh, as repelling each other, and they do, but under certain circumstances, the Coulomb repulsion can be overcome by this phonon attraction, uh, and um, that can lead to superconductivity. The, the reason why it leads to superconductivity is in a hand-waving sense is as follows. Superconducting state is like uh, the Bose-Einstein condensate. It's like the superfluid state, okay? And to get in those superfluid states, you know, you've got to have this coherent um, quantum state, and to get there, you must have bosons. Fermions won't cut it because they're, they're fermions. They don't want to be in the same state. Um, so how do you make fer uh, fermions and bosons? Well, if you take two spin and a half electrons and put them together, you get a, 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 an integral, integral spin system. So it's a boson. So two electrons together behave as bosons, and those bosons might be able to form one of these condensates. So this work of Froelich is absolutely crucial. Um, and Froelich, of course, if you look at the photograph of him here, um, he's obviously a clever chap. I mean, most people have a sort of forehead, um, which, you know, ends a couple of inches above uh, above your uh, eyebrows. In Froelich's case, he's got a forehead which has got an extra two or three stories, I think, on it. And though that extra brain allowed him um, to devote uh, a lot of it to um, uh, superconductivity. Okay. Um, and Froelich, of course, um, his, his life is is so commonplace for people of this era, it's almost a, a cliche. Um, he's German, um, just like the London brothers. Uh, he's Jewish, he's living in um, uh, Germany, he's born in Munich, uh, Munich to Freiburg, um, and um, he has to leave Germany. The things are getting a bit uncomfortable for him. Um, he unusually makes this transition to Leningrad, to Russia, um, and he probably, I suspect, finds that Russia is almost as anti-Semitic as, uh, as Germany, um, and certainly under Stalin, it was a terrible paranoid place to be for um, for foreigners. Uh, so he eventually makes his way to Bristol, uh, to Britain, um, worked in Bristol for a while, then sort of Liverpool, and then eventually to Salford, and was back in Manchester. So that's a that's a typical trajectory of uh, a German scientist in uh, in uh, the early part of this uh, last century. Um, and so, of course, both Britain and America benefited greatly from this kind of migra forced migration of uh, scientists, but not just scientists, artists, novelists, all kind of people just had to leave. It was made too uncomfortable for them. So uh, let's go to the uh, the theory of this system. Um, and this was done by Bardeen, uh, Cooper and Schrieffer uh, at the University of Illinois. Um, I think these two were either postdocs, there's Bardeen there, and these two were the postdocs of, uh, or students of um, of Bardeen. Bardeen had already won one Nobel Prize for development of the transistor and was about to win another one for the uh, BCS theory of superconductivity. Um, and they turned Froelich's sort of idea of electron attraction into something which um, was, uh, shall we say, a proper theory of it, a, a, real, a real detailed theory of superconductivity. Um, and uh, uh, that's, that's, that was their contribution for which they won the Nobel Prize. So, let's look at what uh, what they did. They did. They made what what's called Cooper pairs. 
So, um, what's a Cooper pair? Well, a Cooper pair is basically two electrons paired up to form a pair, which is effectively a boson. So how do Cooper pairs form? Well, we can't really go through the all the detailed calculations in this course. We just don't have enough time, and it's going way off track to do that. Um, but basically, this is the hand-waving explanation. Um, you have an electron moving along through here, through a lattice. Um, it attracts the uh, ions in the lattice uh, a little bit, makes a little tiny ripple, okay? The other electron coming the other way, which is this guy, comes through, comes the other way. Um, it passes in the opposite direction uh, and is attracted to that displacement. And that effectively gives you an attraction between two electrons. That's the hand-waving, you know, semi-classical uh, way of saying how this attraction works. Okay, that's the Cooper pair. So that gives you a Cooper pair. Um, and um, the phonon interaction gives you a Cooper pair. And this Cooper pair has an enormous size, 100 nanometers. Um, whereas the actual lattice spacing is of order 0.1 to 0.4 nanometers. So much, much smaller. So the Cooper pairs you get in this system um, actually have a, a very, very large size. And uh, that's where we'll end uh, this lecture, uh, this video, and we'll go further on in the next video to talk about um, superconducting systems.